Hey there, and welcome to this video about classical China, and we're going to cover all those periods in just a second. But first, just a reminder about the goals of this overview and this cool map of ethno-linguistic groups in China. So you can see this um, sort of brownish area. That's the area today in China. These are its modern borders where the Han Chinese ethnic group lives or is the the most common and you can see around the borders there's other ethnic groups and some people are like up in the hills here these are mountainous regions um, but we're about to learn where that name comes from so you can see the dynasties over here developing over time goes from the Zhou to the warring states period to the Qin and then quickly to the Han the largest and even spreading out along the Silk Road there well China, as you can see from this wonderful GIF, uh, goes through periods of unification and internal conflict. Uh, but throughout this period, isn't conquered by an outside force. And over time, the central government got better and better at controlling larger areas using new technology, new infrastructure like roads and communication systems, um, and also just better ways of thinking about how to rule an empire. We're going to look at all those. So here's an overview of the timeline, and I'm not going to dive in too much to this, but generally the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, we talked about that a little bit last time. We're going to go in depth about why that's important for what comes next. So there's this spring and autumn period. We call it that because of the name of a, a set of texts that we have that describe it rather in depth. Um, it's when the Zhou was collapsing into a bunch of little tiny kingdoms that were all sort of bickering with each other. But for a long time, they just kind of bickered, you know, just went back and forth. But during the Warring States period, those petty kingdoms actually started to like fight it out. Uh, and the people living during that time knew that it was a rough time to be alive. And it really shaped the lives of these people you see here who will start some major philosophical belief systems in China. Um, but then in 221, the Qin dynasty first unified China, but it didn't last very long for reasons you're going to see in a minute. And then we have the Han dynasty, which lasted for more than 400 years, which take a look at those numbers really carefully. Isn't that confusing, right? Because you start at 202 BCE, you count down and you get to zero and then you start really you just get to one and then you start counting up to 220 uh, CE. And so together, that's more than 400 years. Now, during this time period of the collapse of the Zhou and these little states and warlords fighting each other, um, there was, interestingly, a flowering of new ideas because everything was so chaotic, perhaps. Um, and one of them is Confucianism. Uh, it was started by a person who was probably historical, uh, who was a Shur, uh, one of those scholars we learned about in the last uh, video. And he was not very good as an advisor, at least he wasn't successful. Uh, and so he became a teacher and stayed in one spot rather than traveling around. Um, but he was really motivated to answer the question, where did the Zhou go wrong? Um, and he believed it was because the people who ruled the little kingdoms around the Zhou emperor uh, started to not follow the rules, started to not follow the rituals, started to call themselves king. Um, and so he believed that humans are essentially good and that you should respect your elders and that there's this code of harmony that you should follow um, and that you should respect not just your elders, but also your ancestors. Um, and that if you were to just follow all the rules that we know are true already, then everything would be fine. Um, so you have to observe those rituals and call the th everything the right name. Uh, he had these five relationships that you see there, but one of the two persons in each of those relationships had power over the other one. So there was a hierarchy. One was higher up than uh, the other. Um, but each had responsibilities to one another. So it was this kind of like kind, everybody taking care of everybody else and everybody following what they're supposed to do. Right? That's Confucianism. Taoism is totally different, very different reaction to the same set of problems. Um, it supposedly started by a man named Lao Tzu, but it's not really clear that this person ever actually existed. The key ideas were, though, um, humility. So rather than, oh, we know exactly what we're supposed to do here is the ritual, it's how can you actually know that that's what you should do? Who's to say? Why should tradition be followed? which is very uh, upsetting, perhaps, uh, depending on your way of being in life. Uh, but then they also wanted you to follow the simple life, have inner peace, and to have harmony with nature, which really meant, like, don't do anything to try and solve problems because you're likely just going to make them worse, essentially. Um, and really, you can see how these are, are not exactly opposites, but they certainly are opposed on a spectrum, where Confucianism says, we know what to do, just do it. And Taoism says, we don't know what to do, so don't mess it up. So the Qin uh, rose with a different belief system, and you're going to see why that's important. They had one called legalism. And the Qin dynasty, which was the one that unified China, used this authoritarian philosophy. Um, and basically they thought that 
all human nature was essentially wicked and greedy, and you needed really strict laws and harsh punishments to control people. And all people would need to sacrifice their personal freedom for the good of the state, and really the state was the ruler. So the ruler was the state, and everyone had to sacrifice for that guy. Uh, and that turned out to be a really effective set of beliefs to crush all the other little states and create the first unification of China. And in fact, they were so hell-bent on getting the uh other belief systems out that they burned all of the books, particularly Confucian scholars' books, and buried the people who had memorized those books alive. Um, and during that time, they also used this very organized state to build, you know, massive infrastructure projects like roads and canals, and of course, uh, the Great Wall, which you can see some ruins from this time period because the wall was really like built and it fell apart over time. It's built again. It's it's a whole process. Now, an aside about the guy who did the unifying. You'll notice he's Qin Shi Huang. This guy was a warlord turned masterful political organizer and military strategist. He became emperor, right? Unified China for the first time. You can see a really impressive picture down here. Um, and then decided that he wanted to be immortal and probably had some mental health issues and then started taking mercury, which really worsened those. <laughs> Do not take mercury. And then uh, died on his way back from an adventure to shoot at imaginary fish. Um, you can see his crazy tomb down here. These terracotta warriors are human person sized. Look at how many of them there are and like all the horses and stuff. So um, he really sort of lost it there at the end. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that the Qin dynasty collapsed. They, they were super, super strict and led by not so great rulers by the end of that time frame. So they only lasted 14 years. So then there's this guy, Liu Bang. He was one of many people who lived under the Qin who ended up becoming an outlaw. He was a jailer who was supposed to transport some prisoners. He failed at that real bad. A bunch of them escaped. He convinced the other prisoners to become outlaws with him. He turned into a warlord, and he later became emperor and founded the Han Dynasty by beating out all the other warlords. Um, and he's usually depicted in history like this. But here's the video game version of him. All right. Um, so the Han Dynasty had some different political patterns. So Liu Bang, who had revolted against the, the oppressive Qin, said he was going to reject all the harshness and mistakes of the Qin, but actually kept many of the structures uh, and legalist ideologies, which means that's the belief system and ideology. And for example, uh, all the standardized money, transportation, writing systems, and, and legal systems, meaning he made it the same across the whole empire to kind of keep everybody on the same page. And the later Emperor Wu Di shifted this a little bit. Um, Emperor Wu Di organized a thing called the Han Synthesis, which is a way of taking, essentially saying, like, we've got Confucianism, we've got Taoism, we've got lots of really great ideas and these ancient Chinese beliefs, uh, so let's put them together. So he took the Mandate of Heaven that we talked about last time, and they took Confucianism, and they took Taoism, and they took stuff from legalism, and they merged it all together in these ways you can see there. It was brilliant. And they, in fact, created a whole civil service system so that uh, there was some amount of uh, social mobility. You could get up in the world just by taking this test that would allow you to become a public servant. And you can see some, if you wanted to take a test, you come in here. This, this is to help prevent cheating, actually. So if you thought testing was new, eh, you're wrong. Um, so this changed their society in a lot of ways. The emperors uh, aligned themselves with the gentry, this new class of people who owned land, um, but also were able to send their sons up through this school system to become the advisors and, and bureaucrats. And the emperors used that to undermine the power of the large landowning aristocrats who the Zhou had relied on for their power. Um, and they used Confucianism as a guiding philosophy uh, and, in fact, set up that elaborate training system. Um, also, Buddhism uh, spread throughout China during this time and took on some unique Chinese features and then spread to places like Korea and Japan and became dominant there. So the not the original Indian Buddhism, but a sort of new uh, version of it that was more Chinese spread to those places. And then the Han Chinese ethnic group spread out to control all of the land that was good for agriculture and pushed other ethnic groups up into the hills and other places that were not good for that. Um, also of note, social patterns during this time is the idea of feng shui. And th that means earth divination, roughly translated. And it, these were people who were experts in these things. Um, and they were asked, like, what direction should we face buildings and graves? Where should we put this compared to that? And it was a, a way of accessing spiritual power through the organization of the world. Um, 
the economic patterns changed under the Han. They successfully collected taxes on agriculture woo, in order to fund all of the imperial court and military and bureaucracy, which you need to do if you want to stick around. Uh, the government managed the grain supply, so famines were less common, which meant population got larger. Uh, the canals during this time period, which are essentially like fake rivers that you build to make moving heavy stuff easier because you just float it down there on a boat, really easy. Um, also, the Qin had abolished the slave labor system under the aristocrats uh, that was present under the Zhou. And the Han continued that. Um, and in fact, now the peasants owed service to the empire, like military service and, you know, service to build these canals and walls and stuff. Uh, all later imperial capitals would base themselves off of the building structures from this time period, so it's rather important. Um, they also maintained the secret of how to make silk which meant that they had a monopoly on it. A monopoly is when you're the only person selling something and you get to set the price. And they traded that along a thing that got called the Silk Road, which you can see in a map down here in the bottom right corner. And they even built parts of the Great Wall to protect that road and sent military expeditions to make sure they kept control of it. So here's the stuff we have from this time period, the writing and the inventions. Um, Confucianism and Taoism, we don't have writings from their original founders. We have it from the people who followed them. So similar to our issues in India, you got to be careful about um, how ideas are interpreted over time. But, for example, Mencius, uh, the follower of Confucius, had this to say. Confucianism said that uh, women should not participate in public life and that, quote, she must follow the three submissions. When she is young, she must submit to her parents. After her marriage, she must submit to her husband. And when she's widowed, she must submit to her son. And you might be suspicious based on that. If that was used as a belief for society, uh-oh, we're not going to have records from women again, are we? So yes, we don't have a lot of women's experiences present in written records because of this belief system. And though lower class women probably had less restrictions on them, they also weren't writing because uh, it took a lot to learn the Chinese writing system. And they invented lots of paper, though, so we have lots of records, but it's mostly from men. Uh, and then they developed really, really complex metallurgy, so it's working with metals, um, and they used them to advance their society in specific ways, you can see there. And then also they had other inventions, like the water mill and porcelain, which is a kind of pottery you can see over here. This is Han Dynasty pottery. This is what you see when people say porcelain, but this is from a much later period, but I thought I'd put it in here. It develops from this into that. And then also... The horse collar, which is a way for horses to not choke to death when they're pulling plows. Uh, and then, of course, the civil service system is an invention. Think about that. Um, and so I, I hope you take away from this video overall that this time period in China set the pattern for all later Chinese civilization. And that's why we call it that classical period. And I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you think that it was cool. Bye! Bye!